insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 191, Land of the Rising Sun. I am your host, Joseph Whalen, and my adventurous and worldly co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. So how are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. A little tired, but I'm all right. A little tired, still suffering from jet lag? I don't think anymore, just tired because <laughs> I'm actually doing stuff now. Okay, all right. I know you had a, a rough time with the jet lag, and we'll, we're going to get into all of that today. On today's episode, we're going to recap your, was it 10 days in Japan? Kind of. Te- well, technically. 10, ten days well, in Japan and well, three actually, days in the air. <laughs> well, more eight days, technically. Okay. We do have the agenda. We're going to run through that. We're going to have you tell us what it was like, how interesting it was. And yeah, that's what today's podcast is going to be about, because I think uh, a lot of other kids out there would uh, appreciate it from the perspective of a uh, teenager. Before we do that, though, I do want to uh, invite the listening and viewing. I was going to say subscribers, but I'm asking you to subscribe. So if I'm asking you to subscribe, you're not a subscriber yet. So our, our listening audience and our viewing audience. You can find us listed as Insights into Things for all of our podcasts, both video and audio. Uh, You can also find us listed as Insights into Teens, just our audio podcasts, and they're available on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast. I would also invite you to um, write in, contact us. We do have a call-in number now, so uh, no one's actually answering the phones, but you can leave a voicemail on the message itself, and we'll get you on a future podcast with your comments. You can call in to 856-403-8788, or you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter, or X as it is now at insights underscore things where you can find links to all those and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com are we ready sure here we go so before we get into all the fun stuff you did on the trip we kind of have to talk about The transit, the plane ride there. So you had two flights over. You had one flight from Jersey to San Francisco. Well, more Philly to San Francisco. Well, yeah, Philly to San Francisco, coast to coast you went. Yep. Uh, You had a little layover there. And then from there, you jumped across the Pacific all the way over to Japan. How long did it take you uh, total getting there? Well, it took about five hours from Philly to San Fran, and then around 11-ish hours, a little more, a little less, I still don't entirely remember. They technically gave us how long it was, but about 16 hours, I'd say, overall. For just to get there. Yes. Now, the other interesting thing, and, and something that I was struggling with the entire time you were there... It was not only the time difference, but you crossed the international date line. So you were in the future for us. You were 13 hours in the future for us, right? Yep. And I just could not wrap my head around that. How did that affect you when you got there being literally 13 hours off your regular clock? 
Well, the jet lag was probably a cause of that because like when I ended up getting off like the international flight, I felt like I was going to puke. I needed the bathroom. I wanted to eat. I wanted to cry. I wanted to scream. I wanted to collapse all at the same time. <laughs> Sounds like you really had a good time on that trip then, huh? <laughs> well, when I came, when we ended up landing that day, and of course, at that point, it was like two in the afternoon that day, and we had something to do. And I'm like, can we please just head back to a hotel? I don't feel good. But by the time we actually got to the thing, we had like an hour long bus ride. So I was able to kind of calm down. That helps. So this trip wasn't a spur of the moment thing, obviously. This is something that had been in the works for several years now. What did you do prior to the trip to kind of prepare you for the journey or to get you ready to immerse yourself in culture in Japan? Well, for one, I I started using Duolingo and, uh, you know, got to the point of understanding that, you know, uh, it really wanted you to continue your streak because it held your family hostage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It does tend to do that, doesn't it? Uh, it's so, very insistent. So I'd been using that at one point to, you know, learn Japanese to maybe make communication a little easier. We ended up getting a suitcase specifically for um cuz like they wa- they didn't want us to have to check our luggage cuz it wasn't going to be it it was going to take longer uh cuz of the layover, of the and, layover connecting flights and, and connecting stuff. flights and so forth so they ended up wanting us to basically have a carry on bag so we had to pack like 9 days worth of clothes and anything else into like a pretty decently small suitcase and i and uh, we had to basically have that and also possibly have room for souvenirs. And like a bunch of people ended up just buying another suitcase and checking their luggage when we ended up leaving. That's funny. So what did you do on the flight? Were there movies? Did you have books? Did you have any kind of activity or games or anything? Because that, that's a long flight. Thing. Yeah. And and I'm assuming you're like me. You didn't sleep on the flight. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. So you had the five-hour one, which I technically – fell asleep during one hour of it but i really wouldn't say i was sleeping it did not feel like i was sleeping at all i more so just lost consciousness at that point i didn't feel rested afterwards they didn't have really anything but i ended up getting books from like five below that were like puzzle books that i could you know write in and keep myself occupied it was honestly probably it was kind of a boring flight and like it was it wasn't a very fun one, I will admit. Um, but then on the international flight, we had like actual TV screens. They gave us headphones and you were able to watch movies, so watch that was TV from shows. San Fran to Japan. Yes, yeah, so you were able to watch movies, okay. watch um television, and there were even like games on there. There was even actually a mode that I kind of liked, and it was basically like a sort of work focused but also like sleep mode kind of thing where like you would just play like calming music in the background so if like you needed to work on something you had that or if you wanted to sleep but needed noise to block out every other noise out there because there's no way you can sleep on an airplane you could do that and as I alluded to, I did not get any sleep because anytime I would try to go to sleep, something else happened. Like I well, I, I tried to go to sleep at one point and someone else's light went on. When the light went off, someone was snoring. When the person <laughs> stopped snoring, a child would be screaming. And when a child wasn't screaming, a child was just talking loudly well, to Well, you know, parent. at least they all took turns, right? Yeah, which, you know, that kind of made it a little agonizing. And that's kind of why on the returning flight, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to bed. I, I don't nice. care. <laughs> I'm not going to sleep. So I have, I, 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 I arranged the show notes based on the itinerary that you had so if i have something out of order or something like that just let me know and we'll we'll kind of speak around it of course so your first day you were in osaka yep what were your first impressions of osaka what stood out to you that you saw okay well uh, uh we ended up taking a so uh the airport was actually kind of interesting looking because at one point after we went through because of course it's strange to see like all the signs not in English and instead in Japanese because, you know, that's the country you're in. 
But like, it's still kind of weird to see. There was also like a lot of like cartoon characters that like were part of like the signs and symbols and so forth. And then at one point when we were like in a station where we were going to get to the bus, it did not at all look like an airport. It looked more like a mall because like, like it was colored certain ways. It was very bright. And I also saw some interesting elevators, which I hadn't seen before. Um, and when we were on the hour long bus ride, we ended up seeing like some of the shorelines. A lot of the buildings were very interesting because some of them, like the architecture was modern, but not modern as in, in the United States. Like they were built in kind of interesting blocky ways. And then some of them looked more traditional, traditionally Japanese as well. Okay. Interesting. So you guys did do, or you were supposed to do a walking tour of Dantonbori Canal Street. Uh, is that where you guys ate? And how was that experience for you? Oh boy. So yeah, we actually did see like the canal and they actually had like boats going across. So that was kind of neat because we were like stationed on the bridge at one point. And we ended up having like a five minute walk down the street. And it was kind of nerve wracking because like a lot of like the stores and so forth were like very loud because like there were like three instances of I think the same store where there was this animatronic crab and it was like gigantic that at the front. Terrifying. And yeah, and its legs would move and its arms moved up and down. It was really weird. And its eyes would also like bob up and down uh, as well, which was very interesting. And obviously the rest of it, like there were a lot of signs. There were a lot of um, street vendors out there where you could get food and so forth. And basically after we like walked down the entire the street and we were told where certain like food options were, we were given a couple hours to basically go and find your own dinner. And then we were going to meet back at the place where the bus was so that we could get on the bus to the, go to the hotel. So how did finding food work out? Uh, initially, I wasn't really able to do that because I ended up kind of having a panic attack because uh, uh, it was I'm not great with people like in general. And um, I was also in a foreign country, a place I'd never been before, which I don't have great experience with that either if i'm not if i don't if i'm not at a place i get like very antsy if i haven't been there before so it's like i'm always kind of like looking around like where am i and um the prospect of actually going and talking to people to get food i can barely do that in the united states but there was an extra layer to it because in Japan, most people don't speak English. It's not really a primary language. So there was obviously going to be a language barrier there. And I was kind of freaking out. And at one point when me and my one friend, uh, she was getting uh, this thing called melon bread, which I did end up having at one point. But when she was getting that and I was in line behind her, at some point I just freaked out. I was getting scared. People were like walking and like I... The thing is, in Japan, they also don't really like personal space isn't really a thing because like they'll just walk past you with like the smallest gap in between you and somebody else, which I had to learn to adapt to. But like I ended up like pushing myself <coughs> against a wall and I was kind of like crying at that point mm. and freaking out. Thankfully, one of the uh, moms and uh, her daughter. And her daughter ended up like finding me and basically helped to coax me and so forth. Uh, my one friend ended up getting me one of the melon breads with ice cream. It was pretty good. I do recommend it. Uh, and then I and then I ended up getting the confidence to buy a tempura crab leg, which is basically just a crab leg, but fried. Okay. Deep fried, rather. So you did get to experience some of the street food there. Some uh, of the terrifying experiences uh, on the street there. Yeah. Um, but one thing of note is that there was, uh, something, there was a stand called Kobe beef and it's basically just beef on a stick and so forth. Um, I would not really recommend getting that because when someone ended up charging it to their debit card, it came out to be like $75. Well, and Kobe beef is a delicacy in Japan. It's a, it's like a, the finest grade of beef that you can get. Yeah. So it cost them like seven. Uh, 75 US dollars for it. So yeah. I, I wouldn't recommend that. That would be like going to a restaurant here and ordering like a 15 ounce filet mignon. Mm. 
So that's understandable. So the next leg had you going from Osaka uh, to Kyoto, but you stopped in Nara, Japan for a couple of shrines. Tell us how that was. I know you guys did a lot of shrines while you were there. You had Shinto, you had Buddhist. What was the experience like? Did you feel connected to the culture at that point? Was it some, Was there a historical thing that was interesting? What, what can you say about that? Okay, so we visited two shrines in Nara, one that was Shinto and another that was Buddhist. The Shinto one had, I think, was the one that had, like, the most lanterns in it. It, like, had a hundred or something lanterns. And I did, like, find it interesting how connected it was to nature. And, um, because, like, in Nara, they hold deer sacred. So both uh, the Buddhist temple we went to, where we ended up seeing, like, the Nara Great Buddha... Um, so the Buddha and, uh, the Shinto, uh, shrine we went to, they were both connected to something called Deer Park, which we also ended up going to because the deer was sacred in Nara. So, uh, the shrine was, uh, very calming and beautiful. I didn't, uh, it was, they had like a prayer area. There was also the... We had a tour guide as well, and there were Tory gates that were basically these, like, large orange gates, and that basically marked if you were at a shrine, and you'd, like, bow in front of them before you walk in, and then when you left, you would turn around and bow, and then you would leave. Uh, you'd also wash your hands uh, a certain way, as well as your mouth, uh, as a form of purification, because water uh, is seen in the Japanese culture as a form of purification. Um so we did that. And then when we were at uh, the Buddhist temple, we actually learned the history of like this gigantic grand building and how it used to like be much bigger. But like fires and like various um, things would end up destroying most of it. But it's and it would be rebuilt. And there was actually like history inside of it where like you could see like the different they had like different models of it. Oh, okay, cool. So you can see the different versions of the temple. Yeah. All right. So, so it sounds like it was kind of cool. It wasn't overly stressful then. Well. Okay. Maybe, that it, was, was. maybe that, it was. Well, that wasn't what stressed me out. It was more so the fact that at that point, my legs, like, I, I don't walk often. So my legs were really starting to hurt. It was also pretty hot for me. And it also started raining. And at that point, I was also hungry and tired. So at one point, I end at the when we were leaving the Buddhist temple to go to the deer park, I ended up breaking down. Okay, all right. I'm glad you kept score. I uh, yep, I, I keep I keep score of all my <laughs> breakdowns because you know not really the most normal thing to be happening as I didn't see anyone else that had breakdowns well, like was, I did. You were very out of your element. I, I give you a lot of credit for for how brave you were and, and stepping so far out of your element. Thank you. So you move on from Nara to Kyoto, and in Kyoto, you saw the famous Temple of a Thousand Gates. Yep. Tell us about that. Okay, so... that seems excessive to me. I mean, yeah. Uh, it was honestly uh, very interesting, because that was a much... That was like... There was a lot of culture with that, because we also learned about how the fox is seen as a lucky symbol, and there were a lot of, like, different fox statues, as they were kind of seen as, like, the messengers of the gods. Um, so we learned why, like, the fox was a lucky animal, because the thing is, the fox eats the mice that eat the rice, because rice is obviously grown in Japan and it's seen as one of as their most valuable crop. So anything that kills the mice is seen as a lucky animal. So cats and foxes tend to be those lucky animals. So there's like these masks that are made that are meant to, you know, embody the animals. Interesting. That's a very practical approach to how they determine what animals are lucky and not. You know, some places, and I guess a lot of cultures are like that, like Indian culture reveres cows, and I guess the cows play a major role in life there. But, you know, the fact that it's, they're revering animals that protect their food source makes a lot of sense. How did you find the gate? So you didn't walk all the gates, right? Yeah, we ended up 
Uh, we ended up like walking under some and then there was a pathway with smaller gates that were actually donated uh, to the area. And then there was like this one off area that had a couple significant like religious shrines and so forth. There's actually this interesting ritual I want to bring up where uh, basically you would put in a coin and you'd want to and you'd make your wish in your head and there was this rock. So if you lift the rock and it's heavier than you think, your wish won't come true for a while. But if you lift it and it's lighter than you think, your wish is going to basically come true instantly. Almost sounds like, the, you know, Punxsutawney Phil and the Groundhog, you know. <laughs> kind of, but I honestly thought it was interesting. And they also mentioned how there are tour gates that you buy in the one shop area and people actually bring it up the gates up all up to the mountain to basically leave it there for the Shinto god. And I did end up like seeing, like looking down all the gates. And not only are the gates like in a line, but there's also like steps to where you go up. And I have heard that of people that do that, but I think it takes like three hours wow. to get up them all. Uh, it was very impressive to see. I didn't do it because I'm not good with stairs and heights and so right. forth. But it was very impressive to see. And it was very interesting how like there were different like obviously how we have here Puxatani Phil for Groundhog's Day. They have, you know, the stone rocks for their wishes. And they have like they had like other uh, things that were meant to be wishes. Like there were these wooden tablets that you would buy at them. You'd write down uh your wish and you'd leave it on like these boards okay so having visited the various shrines and having your first taste of japan there uh how did you describe how would you describe the cultural importance that the shrines and religion play in the lives of day-to-day -day people in japan i feel like uh after seeing all the shrines um wishing is Wishing and praying is like a major aspect of the culture for Japan, as well as the symbols like the fox and the cat and how and like I learned more about like how each of those symbols were lucky in their own ways. Um, and, you know, the whole like wish making, because uh, like the thing is, there's like many many gods in japan there's like matchmaking gods there's gods of nature there's gods of the mountains and each of them hold various significances and basically like especially with shinto you don't you basically don't have to believe in it fully or at the very least you can ha have most of your beliefs held in one religion but you could still go to like shinto shrines and pray there and the god will still like hear you and um you know, grant you your wish or your prayer. And a lot of them also don't depict their gods either. It's just like you have a general shrine area. You don't see what the god looks like, but you still, you know, offer uh, offer up your prayers and wishes. Interesting. It sounds it sounds like it's a very passive way of, of going about religion, unlike some of the more western style religions out there it actually sounds kind of inviting and i did actually see like there were other like it wasn't like just buddhism or shinto or shintoism there was also like i did actually see like a catholic church uh in japan as well a couple of other churches and stuff like that so there are like obviously other religions there and there's and it, it was definitely interesting to see how all of it kind of played into not only the cultural history of Japan, but also the architectural history and just the traditions of Japan. Fascinating. Well, I think we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to pick it up in Kyoto on day four and move on from there. We'll be right back. Are you tired of your favorite gaming podcast finishing with a play? Oh, no! Well, check out No Credits Rolled, where we play the games but rarely finish them. How's it going, folks? I'm Sam Whalen, your friendly host at No Credits Rolled, the ultimate gaming podcast, where we dish out the latest scoops and reviews on all your beloved video games. Hey, listen! Not only that, but we spice things up with some guest interviews and even give you, yes, you, a chance to have your say. Tune in every other week for a fresh dose of No Credits Rolled, available on all major podcast platforms, and hit us up on social media at No Credits Rolled. So why wait? 
let's dive into the gaming world together, where finishing games is optional, but the fun is guaranteed. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We are talking about a recent trip to Japan that you took. So you were in Kyoto for two days? Yes. You went to the bamboo forest. So tell us about the bamboo. What do they have in the bamboo forest? Well, you can take <laughs> as many guesses as you want, but I'm assuming you'd get it on the first try. A bamboo, pretty much. <laughs> and like there was one spot where like you could go deeper into the forest and there was, but like we ended up kind of stopping there. I didn't go into it because at that point we had already seen a bunch of bamboo. It was very pretty and it got me to appreciate nature, but it was really like, is that... Like, at that point, I didn't really see too much of a point in going forward because there was also, like, a whole other town where we were expected to get lunch at. Which, by that point, and all the panic attacks I had had, I was like, you know what, I'm just, just take me to the bus, please. The bus was still there, so it's like, can, can I just stay at the bus? So our tour guide, Keiko, was thankfully kind enough to escort me back to the bus because it was genuinely a really long walk and my feet were already hurting and I'm like yeah I I can't because like that was the busiest street we've seen like there was no space between anybody and like I had to be very careful to make sure I was still following her because the crowds were just insane and I'm like yeah if I know if I try to navigate this through myself I'm going to panic again which you know at least I knew my limits that's true so while you were there, you also saw, you visited uh, the, and I'm going to hopefully not pronounce this too bad, the Nijo Castle? Yes. Tell us about that and the Golden Pavilion. Okay, so the Nijo Castle was actually the first thing we did that day. And it was very interesting because it, obviously I have a more like kind of Western and European style of thinking of what a castle looks like. Looks nothing like that. It like it had purely white walls. It had a moat, uh, which was kind of the only like resemblance to it. But it still looked like a traditional Japanese architecture. We actually went inside where and it's like a pagoda style architecture with the the vaulted roofs and, and curved roofs and stuff, right? Yeah, and it also had like uh, very nice looking trees around uh, the border. And when we actually got in the castle, there was no photography and we actually had to take our shoes off. Uh, so we ended up walking around. They had like dioramas um, that like, it was basically like a show. It was kind of like the place where a shogun would be who uh, in... Japanese history, the shogun used to be like an influential political figure that like had samurai that would protect him. And I think was like a head, it was basically a head samurai and so forth. So we ended up like seeing all the different rooms, all the different waiting rooms for if you wanted to see the shogun. We saw uh, replicas of samurai and the shogun himself. Uh, It was very interesting. Uh, oh, yeah. And then uh, outside the one gift shop that everyone went to, I had another panic attack and had to go outside. Thankfully, the one uh, nurse that was on the trip ended up kind of taking me away because it was very crowded in there and I could barely make sense of anything. OK, well, I don't think we need to keep score of the panic attacks anymore. I understand that. So at the castle, like here, when you visit a historic site in, in the U.S. and even in Europe, you often encounter people that are reenactors, docents that are in there trying to explain the different things. Did they have anything like that there in, in the tour where they had someone doing explanations of what the different things of the castle were? Anybody in costume or anything like that? Well, we did have a tour guide that I guess kind of specialized in it. And he basically like talked about the sort of stuff. And the interesting thing is that like you can actually there's actually like still various traps in there that are like if anyone was going to break in, there'd be like different traps and so forth. And like, I guess there's a way that you can tell that there's like some sort of trap in there. And he actually like asked us to be like, uh, be on the lookout for something like that. And if you figure out what the trap is, let me know. And so forth. Uh, Interesting. Interesting. Uh, But he was our general tour guide as well. Okay. So you moved on from that to the Golden Pavilion. Now, was the Golden Pavilion in the same location? No, we actually like had to take a bus to a different location for it. So what was the Golden Pavilion? Uh, It was 
honestly very interesting because like the entire top half of it is made out of gold. Actual gold. Yep, actual gold. gold. It was very like beautiful to see and they were like they was also surrounded by like a big lake and there were also like trees um that were also planted around it that looked very nice. Trees in Japan look very different than trees in the US for the yeah. most part unless you go into the mountain area, but that was very uh it was very nice to see and thankfully it was a it it helped me at that point I also had another one of the parents helping me to calm down and uh, you know, to at least appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, the Golden Pavilion was uh, very pretty. Okay. So from here, you moved on to what would have been my favorite part of the trip, and that's you got to ride the bullet train. Yep, that was the next day. The Shinkansen. How was that? Explain to us what the... Because I know they're on a very tight schedule there. You only have a certain amount of time to get on. Okay. What was that like? So we ba- so we had to basically carry our luggage around for most of the trip. But when it came to uh, the day that we spent um, after the bullet train, we couldn't take our luggage with us because if we were to try and get it on the bullet train, it would take us much longer and probably we wouldn't have been able to get on it. So basically, we had to pack in our backpacks what we were going to need for a night's stay in the one hotel so that and then we'd eventually have our bag shipped to uh, Tokyo. So we all had to do that. And then when we got to the station, we all had to make sure we were on time. And when the doors open to it, we had to all rush in because they only stay open for two minutes. So anyone that needed to get off had to get off and then everyone that needed to get in had to get in. Okay. How was the ride? Was I know you were fast. I know statistically the, the train gets up to 200 miles an hour. Did you feel like you were going fast? When I was inside, the only thing that really indicated that we were going fast is that my ears had to like pop constantly. It was actually surprisingly relaxing. The inside was kind of like a bigger airplane in a way because it had three seats and an aisle and they also had like tray tables on the chairs and like a little basket to hold stuff. But like the leg room, it, there was a lot more leg room. The aisle was a lot bigger. It was honestly very comfortable and the seats themselves were also like okay. pretty spacious. I will admit the outside was not at all what I was expecting it to look like. I was expecting it to be like this very futuristic, very techy, very like metallic glass, like kind of open glass sort of area. And it's like it was basically kind of like a mo- like a monorail. It was basically like a plane, but a, as a train. Right. It looked like it had, it had kind of like a polyester white ish white stained outside and i'm like what this this doesn't really look like how i was expecting it i think it was kind of like i thought it was like you know future techie and so forth and it really kind of didn't look all that like futuristic the inside was nice looking but like it still kind of resembled like you were inside of an airplane and i'm like okay did not expect this at all so you've ridden trains in the u.s and now you've ridden a train in japan how do they compare well, with this one, there were honestly, there were like a lot of tunnels and like there were tunnels that were immediately pitch black to the point that when I was filming at one point, we went in one of the tunnels and like I could clearly see my reflection because of how like dark the outside was. Uh, the train itself uh, was uh, fast, obviously, and the boarding part of it, like the doors themselves were honestly like very small surprisingly and like you did kind of have to push your way out because it literally stayed open for only two minutes and like everyone was worried that we either left someone at the station or we left someone in the train thankfully we all got out in time though (laughs) okay so from there where did you wind up so you went there you went to see uh odawara castle next yeah what was that was that smaller or bigger than the first castle I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of not, I think it was a little bigger uh, okay. than the other one, but like the other one, like the building itself was smaller, but like the out, like the whole like protection it had around it, I think was bigger. Okay. 
So you were also up in the Fuji Hakone Izu National Park, if I pronounce that right. That was where you took a cruise on Lake Ashi. Yep. How was that? Okay, so, well, we actually did a couple of things there. For one, there was a cable car ride up the one mountain. I didn't do that because I'm afraid of heights, but I stayed down with uh, our with one of like, with I think the teacher that I ended up um, orchestrating the whole trip and um, there they had like a bunch of you're also supposed to do lunch there so there were a bunch of different like restaurants and so forth and that's where I actually got the first souvenirs and that's actually like the part of the trip that I actually started to enjoy more uh, the boat cruise was very interesting because the boat itself had like four different layers to it and like there was a very cozy looking relaxation area on the second uh floor on the third floor they had like swings that were kind of like they were bolted to the ground but like you could still kind of swing in them they also had like almost beach chairs and benches as well they had like a lot of comfortable looking seating and the lake itself was actually formed because of volcanic activity. So it's at a high elevation, but like water circulation was cut off because of the mountains that were created. So it turned into a lake. Uh, so there were mountains all around it. And you could also see a lot of the buildings. And I got a lot of really cool shots from it. So that region itself is actually very well known, the National Park region there, for its natural landscapes and stuff like that. Does it compare to anything you've ever seen in the United States or is it something that's that's just unique to Japan? I mean, like, I'm pretty sure there would be, you know, like mountain ranges that were kind of similar. But I did think it was interesting that all around the lake, it was mountains and like some of them got higher than others. And when we were on the bus, there were a lot of really interesting like mountain areas that we actually like drove past. Some of them actually looked like they were steaming, but it was probably just the fog, but it was still like, you know, really cool to see. Okay. So from there, you were moving on to Tokyo uh, via Kamakura, right? Mm -hmm. And you stopped at the, I'm going to murder this one. Hashi Mangu, Mangu Shrine, where the great Buddha of Kamakura is. Yes. Let's talk about that one a little. Okay, so that one, it's pretty much at the area we went to, it was pretty much just this Buddha. And while it didn't compare to this, it, it was around, it was a little smaller than the first Buddha we'd seen in Nara, but like it was still like interesting to see. We ended up getting like some more history about the Buddha itself. Uh, there were, like interest they were like say uh there was like uh incense that were being burned uh there was also something in front of it that was like fruit and offerings and so forth uh but that was also kind of just it the buddha itself was like i think you could actually pay money to like go inside the buddha um but for the most part the buddha was kind of just the whole thing and we were given like over an hour to stay there and at one point me and my friend just ended up going uh to um just go back to the bus that was also the first time i experienced a public restroom in japan and by first i mean only okay because i mean i don't like public restrooms in general but in japan they have bidets like everywhere pretty much because like 80 percent after it was made 80 percent of like japanese homes now have bidets so ex explain for the audience what a bidet is uh basically it's a very high-tech toilet that has the ability to like it it's mostly i think it's mostly kind of something that women use because it's not something that men often use unless they're not just going to use the restroom in well so it's basically <laughs> something that squirts water and washes your bottom yeah pretty much right. I, I don't know how to say <laughs> that you know and the thing is some of them are actually different because some also like have seat warmers and can also sense when you're on it so like when you sit down your your butt gets warm it's good to know the, the bidets were the highlight of the trip. Well, it wasn't really the <laughs> highlight because I don't think I'm ever really going to be able to use one because I didn't actually use the water spray function because some of them also made noise when you got on them. And I think some of them could even play music for you. So you guys ate while you were there too, right? Um, Not at that place. But you ate in that local area there. Probably, yeah. It wasn't a fast food place to eat. Yeah. So... 
how does the food compare from region to region? Is it similar? Do they have local uh, food variations that they have, or is it pretty much the same wherever you ate local? Well, in certain areas, there were actually like delicacies of like the specific region. Like some stuff was more common in Osaka than in Kyoto. Um, and there were like, like even the places we went to, there were certain foods that were made specifically because of the region it was in. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also had a bunch of fast food places like Wendy's, uh uh, we ended up seeing like KFCs, McDonald's, Starbucks. So they're fairly modern. So yeah, they still have like you know your typical like fast food uh, areas that you'd see in the United States. Okay, so from there you moved on to Tokyo, and we're going to take our last break, and we're going to come back and wrap up your last two days, starting with Tokyo. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. We are talking all things Japan, or at least all things Japan trip on today's episode of Insights in the Teens. So we have arrived in Tokyo. What was your first impression of Tokyo? Big city, very crowded, very packed in. Another area to be out of your element there. But but what was your first impressions of it? What, what did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? I mean, at that point when we were in Tokyo, like I'd finally gotten used to everything. And it was definitely different because like in Osaka, like it was a very like food centric area, which is why, you know, we tried a lot of the food at that point. In Kyoto, it was fashion centric. And also because it used to be the capital for like over a thousand years uh, in Japan, the people like we were actually told like uh the woman that was uh, that ended up guiding our tour the whole way she originally was in Hiroshima but ended up moving to Kyoto when she um uh, when I think her daughter graduated and she learned very quickly that the people of Kyoto are somewhat like kind of have an air of a, a sense of arrogance almost like like an almost like aristocratic flair because well, of the prestige of the city well kind of um they were like they she mentioned how like some of them would make like like backhanded com compliments and so forth and like like if they said like oh you have a nice watch that basically like you had a party that basically meant that they wanted you to leave mm. which was interesting you know so while you were there, you did see a couple more temples, right? Yeah. And uh, anything highlight-wise worthy of mentioning from the uh, temples, the Asakusa Canon Temple and the Meiji Shinto Shrine? Well, one of them had like a set of 60 stairs that we ended up climbing up. That was... <laughs> like Rocky. Yeah. I mean, there were people that men made that reference as well. Like, I want to run up this like Rocky and so forth. It was very tiring to get all the way up there. Um, but still, obviously, very nice architecture. Um, and then uh, the other shrine was actually a nature based god. So the traditional Tori temple is typically painted orange. But I guess in like the nature centric shrines, they actually don't paint them. And like you see the like natural wood of the gate. Interesting. Interesting. 
So you also attended the Akihabara Electric Town? Or did no, you? we didn't do that. You didn't do that. Okay. That was still on the agenda then. So we didn't do that. What else did we do that was that was interesting in Tokyo? Uh, well, there was Joypolis. Ah, yes. Talk about that. So Joypolis is basically this indoor amusement park. I think that one of the biggest in Japan. And uh, it it's entirely VR, but like they actually had amusement rides that used VR. I didn't go on any of them, but I did see one that did like it. There was kind of like almost an upside down roller coaster at one point where you like actually wore uh, VR glasses. They also had a ton of um, claw machines and something that I ended up using a lot in the end of the trip uh, were these vending machines that you'd put some yen coins in and you'd turn it and then you'd get like something out obviously so that's interesting that, that you mentioned that so before you went one of the other things preparation things was exchanging some u.s currency for japanese yen what's the almost comedic ratio that you're looking at for yen to u.s dollars to, as, as an equivalent uh, it was very interesting because, like, I I ended up we ended up looking it up at one point, and it's like about thirty dollars in U.S. currency is five thousand yen in Japan, and along with that, everything is very cheap in Japan. So I actually remember I would get they were also like except very, for the Kobe beef. Well, yeah, except <laughs> that, but. Uh, when it came to like getting, there was also like a bunch of vending machines for drinks and so forth. And at one point when I ended up getting a Sprite, I paid, I think, 140 yen for it, which actually is less than a dollar in U.S. Uh, currency. And it was an entire can of Sprite. That's funny. That's almost like paying pennies in the United States for things yeah, rather like, than dollars. Yeah. And I got a and I got a uh, Dr. Pepper as well, and that was only a dollar. Wow. Okay. So you guys did Joyopolis. You also had kind of a free day or somewhat of a free day that you guys could do stuff. What did you wind up doing with that free time? Well, after dinner, uh, me and a good portion of the trip – Went to Tokyo Disneyland. And how did that go? Well, trying to get there was kind of a pain because <laughs> we wasted like an hour trying to get an Uber for everybody because we had to like get a good number of people because the max you could get is like five. But then we had to downsize to four so that we had an easier time with the Uber, which was, you know, fun to have to figure out. But when we got there, we figured out where the entrance was, thanks to um, a couple that showed us where we needed to go. By that point, we had like two hours before the park closed. Um, so and like we only had to pay like thirty three dollars to get in from five to nine. Yeah, that half day price is just insane because you guys bought the tickets ahead of time. Yes. Uh, online. And mommy helped you out getting that stuff taken care of. So you had your tickets walking in. Uh, you were there two hours. What can you do in Tokyo Disneyland for two hours? Um, well, at one point I wanted to, at the very least, go to the Tokyo, uh, Disneyland Haunted Mansion because, uh, mommy is a big Haunted Mansion fan. She is. I'm saying it for the audience's <laughs> sake. I don't know if they have seen anything relating to that. So it's hard not to if you actually watch the video version of the podcast. Not, I, I, not get that. I get that. Uh, so I actually went with uh, the same parent that had been helping me because I wanted to at the very least get some picture of the Haunted Mansion. And I did, but they didn't come out as anything because it was not lit up like everything else. Yeah. So you couldn't even see it. But we were able to go on it. And it honestly is very interesting how different it is because it is actually based on the original version of the Magic Kingdom Haunted Mansion. But it hasn't been updated, at least with like the modern scenes, like with Constance's backstory or anything. So we went in. The narration is entirely in Japanese, which, you know, not that big of a shock. 
Uh, they didn't have like the one like interactive queue line that they have uh, in the States. When we uh, got in uh, the ride itself, uh, it actually starts off in like when when you're in the Magic Kingdom ride, when you go through the one hallway where the lightning comes in and the paintings are changing, they actually have it so that the paintings that used to be in like the waiting area where you would get on the doom buggies, those paintings and the paintings that were in the changing portrait line are actually like all in the same room. There's no windows. They're all like kind of tilting. The Mariner one is at the top of the wall. It's honestly a very different scene okay. compared to in. So it was definitely a different experience then. Yep. Uh, there were books in the library that looked like they were new. The one of my one of the worst differences I saw was instead of the endless staircases, they were like three spider figures just that were for there. You. They, they put them in just for you. For <laughs> and that of course, trip. they made them like neon colors, so they were incredibly obvious. In uh, the lights themselves were all red, which I thought was interesting when you ended up getting into the hallway and so forth. There was also this painting that like it was like a solid thing, but it looked like it jumped out at you like a face was melting into it. Oh, that's cool. And then one of the doors had green light coming out of it. And like you genuinely thought like there was like scratching and it like it kind of jumped at you as if something was pounding against the door. Uh, the Madame Leota scene, she was all in English, which I thought was strange. And there was a lot less going on in her seance room. Uh, the ballroom scene was pretty much the same. Constance's was, again, based on the original version where she was known as the beating heart bride. And all throughout, you hear like her beating heart. And they were actually a lot more like the jumping ghosts, like the ones that you see in the graveyard. And I, I unfortunately got scared by some of them, which... Yeah. They, ought, they always did get to you. The graveyard scene and everything else was kind of the same, but it did actually look nicer in Tokyo. And then with the um, hitchhiking ghosts, when it came to the mirror scene, instead of like doing anything with like your heads or anything and switching them around, they kind of just like were in there shaking their heads like, hey, we're with you or something. Bobblehead ghost. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, and that kind of wrapped up the majority of the trip there. We're going to take a quick break, come back, and we'll let you wrap up with your final thoughts on what you enjoy, what you didn't enjoy, what, how you're going to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. We'll be right back for that. All right, so as the first time I traveled internationally, Japan was definitely interesting. It's somewhat like in the States and then also not at all either. There were things that reminded me of the States, but also things that had nothing to do with the States. Um, it was definitely hard to get used to in the beginning, which I feel is why I got I was kind of antsy about it in the beginning. But I eventually did find my comfort level with it and it became a very enjoyable experience. And I'm very glad that I did it. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you did it too. I commend you for having the courage. I think it took a lot of courage to put yourself in a position that was so outside your comfort zone. And yeah, you had a couple of panic attacks, but I think for the most part, you, know, you didn't give up on it. You you managed to get through it. And uh, I have to tell you, I'm I'm very proud of you for for sticking it out there and and being able to cope with it, because it was probably the most difficult thing I think you've had to do in a very long time. So that's all we had for today. Uh, before we go, I want to once again uh, invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into teens. You can find audio and video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as insights into things. And we're available on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, Buzzsprout, etc. I would also invite you to write into us. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. You can hit us up on X at insights underscore things. You can find uh, streaming five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. 
You can also give us a call now. Leave a message for us and we'll get you on one of the future podcasts. You can call in to 856-403-8788. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.